Howdy, partner. Today is the final uh, episode of our journey in Unit 1. Last time we talked about how energy enters an ecosystem. Today I want to talk about how it flows between or within an ecosystem. How does energy travel between living things and non-living things? When I say that, uh, well, I don't mean bi abiotic things like rocks and water. What I mean is um, dead animals. So they're still biotic. Um, and that tends to manifest itself in, in the form of a food chain or a trophic web, something you've probably seen before. So last time we learned about how energy enters the ecosystem, primary productivity through photosynthesis, harnessing the sun's solar energy and converting it into chemical energy. But how does it flow through those ecosystems? And I'm not talking about your flow if you're working on your lyrics, although if you want advice, let me know. I'm your guy. I'm talking about how that energy is going to flow from organism to organism. And it does that through predation, through consumption, right? Uh, the grass produces energy, so we call it a producer, uh, but from the sun using photosynthesis. But a grasshopper is going to consume that grass. And it's going to get energy from that grass by eating the sugars that the grass has built using the sun's energy. Uh, because a grasshopper is the first level of consumer, we call it a primary consumer. A grasshopper might get eaten by a chipmunk or a squirrel. That is the second level of consumer, we call that a secondary consumer. A hawk would eat that rodent and get some energy from the rodent. That's a tertiary level consumer. All of these things, when they die, along with things like twigs and leaves, um, are still biotic and therefore can get broken down by decomposers like worms, bacteria, and fungi. So some of that energy will actually cycle a little bit, uh, but all of the matter will cycle. Um, you might notice some energy is being lost here, these red arrows being lost as heat. I'll get to that in a little bit. So what, what I just showed you here is a, a food chain, uh, but a, a trophic web is a little bit more complicated. So you could call this a trophic chain. A trophic just refers to the level of uh, eating, uh, so to speak, right? Uh, uh, these are autotrophs because they, they're automatically, they're able to, to produce their own food. A heterotroph is an organism that can't produce its own food. Uh, so troph refers to sort of the level of, of consumption. The first trophic level is the primary consumer, second trophic level is the ter or secondary consumer, and the third uh, trophic level of consumers is the tertiary consumer. In a trophic web, it's not just a straight line, it's a little bit more complicated. You can see, well, there are multiple primary consumers, perhaps. Um, you know, we've got this cactus as a producer, a kangaroo rat is a primary consumer. We've got a couple different secondary consumers going on here, right? Um, we've got the fox as a secondary consumer, uh, and the hawk eats the um, snake, uh, and, and the hawk also eats the rats, uh, right? So uh, there's a little bit of... Um, complexity going on here. We've got insects that are decomposers um, and the lizard eats an insect. So you could say the lizard is a secondary consumer, the scorpion is a secondary consumer. Uh, general rule of thumb is sort of count the arrows. So primary consumer, secondary consumer. Right? These arrows indicate a couple things. One, they indicate the transfer of energy. Uh, they indicate that energy is flowing from the cactus to the rat, from the rat to the fox from the snake to the fox. This is, probably should be an arrow here, actually. Uh, snakes probably eat these um, rats. Um, but they, not only do they indicate transfer of energy, they indicate transfer of matter, because these kangaroo rats are going to consume the, the actual physical being of the plant and incorporate that to help it build tissues in its own body. So will the fox. And therefore, it's also indicating transfer of nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, etc. Uh, let's do some uh, practice questions with this more complex food web of a kelp forest. Okay, so, um, right, uh, we've got primary producers down here. A sea urchin is a secondary, con uh, or a primary consumer because it's eating these primary producers. Uh, and, and if we're just looking at this relationship between the urchin and the sea otter, the sea otter would be a secondary consumer. But it's obviously more complicated than that, right? Because sea otters eat these large fish, and these large fish eat the crabs, and the crabs eat the dead algae, right? So in theory, the sea otter is both a secondary and maybe a quaternary consumer at the same time. Don't get caught up in the terminology, right? I'm not going to give you a situation where you have to tell me all the different um, characteristics. Is it a tertiary, secondary? You know, because it can be more than one at the same time. Um, but for something like this, it's a little more cut and dry. 
that's the kind of thing that you'll be responsible for analyzing it or maybe something like this but this is extra extra complicated um, now, I mentioned earlier that um, energy is lost, and the reason for that is because of the second law of thermodynamics. The first is that energy can't be created or destroyed. The second is that energy tends to move, or things in, in the universe tend to move towards chaos. You may have heard the term entropy. Entropy increases. And what that results in is that a transformation of energy from one trophic level to the next is never going to be 100% efficient. The urchin is never going to get all of the energy from the kelp. And the otter is never going to get all the energy from the urchin. So you see some diminishing returns going on here. Um, and that could be true of any energy transformation. You look at the engine in your car, combustion engine, you're probably only getting about 18% of the energy that's in the gasoline is actually being used to propel the car forward. What's happening to the rest of that 82%? Well, your engine makes sound and it produces heat. Those are forms of energy, and most of the energy that gets lost, that 82%, probably coming off is heat. Same with the campfire. There's a lot of potential energy in this wood, but not all of it goes towards making heat, because some of it goes towards making light and even sound as well. So energy transformations are never 100% efficient. And you can see that in this diagram, right? These red arrows. Most of the time, the energy from if, if a grasshopper eats grass, it's not going to get all this energy. In fact, most of that energy is going to get lost as heat. That's why we produce body heat. Um, and the general rule is that only about 10% of the energy is going to get transferred. So if I eat, um, I don't know, 100, if I eat a plant and it's, it's got 100 kilocalories from its net primary productivity, I'm only going to get 10 of that. I'm only going to get 10%. 90% of that energy is going to get lost as heat in every single energy transfer. That seems wildly inefficient, right? Um, but if you look at the combustion reaction, um, you'll see that whether you're lighting a match, lighting a fire, or you're doing um, cellular respiration in your mitochondria, heat is released. Sometimes some of it's in the form of energy, uh, energy that gets trapped as ATP, but some of it is just lost as heat. That's why fire is hot, and that's why we have body heat right? It's because there are tiny little explosions going on in your mitochondria every single millisecond. You can see this phenomenon in something called an energy pyramid. Sometimes it's called a biomass pyramid. It's basically like a food chain, but it's in the shape of a triangle or a pyramid. On the bottom, we've got the producers. They're getting 100% of the energy that they create because they're creating it. The things that eat those producers, those primary consumers or herbivores, are only getting 10% of that initial energy. The things that eat herbivores, uh, secondary consumers um, the, or carnivores are only going to get 1% of the total base energy. Uh, things that eat those carnivores, in this case tertiary consumers, are going to get a, a percentage of that, 0.1% of the initial energy. And these things at the top, right, quaternary consumers, are only going to get 0.01% of the energy that was initially available in plants. And this is why you should eat more plants, right? Because uh, again, uh, whoops, uh, the sun, uh, if, if we eat spinach, we're getting 10% of that base energy, right? Because we're eating, we're eating uh, plants. But if we uh, use grass to feed a cow to then feed our hamburger or to make our hamburger, which feeds us, we're only getting 1% of that total energy. So it's more energy efficient to eat plants, to eat lower down the food chain. That's one argument, one of the many arguments for um, moving, shifting towards a more... Uh, vegetarian-based diet. Uh, here's another picture of a energy pyramid showing uh, the terminology that I've been using, primary, secondary, and tertiary consumers, and you can see with actual values, 1,000 kilocalories to plants, only 100 for the primary consumers, 10 for the secondary, and only 1 for the tertiary consumers. Try this practice problem out using the kelp forest food web. Okay, uh, it's a little bit tricky, right? So if the kelp plant's annual net primary productivity is 833 kilocalories per meter square, how much will be available to the sea urchins? Well, the sea urchins, it's only one energy transformation. They're only going to get 10% of that. So they're going to get 83.3 kilocalories. And the sea otters are going to get 10% of that. So they're going to get 8.33 kilocalories. So they're going to have to eat a lot of sea urchins to get the same amount of energy as the sea urchins do from getting the, eating the kelp. 
Uh, last thing I want to talk about is a phenomenon called a trophic cascade, which is kind of like a domino effect in a food web, right? I urge you to think about what happens if we remove this sea otter from the food web. All the sea otters in this, po in this environment go extinct. What's going to happen to the food web? Is it going to stay the same? Probably not. Um, if we remove the food, uh, the sea otters, suddenly sea urchins, sea stars, abalones, larger crabs, and large fish don't have a predator anymore. If they don't have predators, their population is going to skyrocket. Nothing's keeping them down. And if we see sea urchin populations skyrocketing, well then, all of a sudden, the things that sea urchin eats are going to start to feel the heat. Because there's a lot of sea urchins, and there's not as much kelp, so they're going to get eaten. Uh, and it's important to remember this graph I showed you, the predator-prey cycling, right? As the predators go up, the prey is going to go down. And as the prey goes down, the predators are then going to follow down, right? They, they both depend on one another. They impact one another. And that can lead, oops, that can lead to uh, a, this phenomenon called a trophic cascade, cascading like a domino effect, where the sea otters have a negative impact on the, on the urchins by eating the urchins, and the urchins have a negative impact on the kelp by eating the kelp. Well, negative and a negative make a positive, right? So in theory, the, the otters are actually having a positive impact on the primary producers, on the kelp, right? Because they're limiting the amount of herbivores available. What that means is if you remove otters from the ecosystem, urchins are going to run wild and the kelp is going to have a bad time. Here's a simple drawing. If there's a wolf present, the deer population is kept in check and the trees are allowed to grow leaves um, without getting over uh, eaten by the deer. But if we lose out the wolves, the deer population is going to skyrocket and the trees are going to suffer as a result. That's a trophic cascade. We'll do some practice with that in class next time. Uh, bring your questions and I will see you then.